So good morning and good afternoon, good evening to YPOers and friends around the world. And a special welcome today to participants from our partner Synergos, a community we're honored to be part of and we, who, with whom we've partnered for this, the first in Synergos' Cultivate the Soul virtual gathering of 2021. I'm Dick Simon, co-founder and learning officer of the YPO President's Action Now Goal Chapter and founder and chair of the YPO Psychedelic Medicine for Mental Health Group, as well as a member of the Synergos community. I spend all of my time helping advance this work, both because of the incredible evidence and data for its efficacy addressing otherwise intractable treatment resistant mental health, and on a personal level, having learned in our family how difficult these problems can be. This call will be 90 minutes with a question and answer session following Michael and my conversation. If you have any questions, please submit them via the Q&A feature on your Zoom screen and we'll get to them during the Q&A session. Please note that this call is being recorded and the recording link will be sent to all registrants at approximately, in approximately 24 hours. This is a good reason, by the way, to sign up for future programs, even if the live timing doesn't work for you. So we're incredibly privileged to be joined today by Michael Pollan, who needs absolutely no introduction, but I'll give a bit of one anyway. Uh, <laughs> Michael is the author of eight books, six of which have been New York Times bestsellers, including his latest, How to Change Your Mind. What this new science of psychedelics teaches us about consciousness, dying, addiction, depression, and transcendence. Many working in the psychedelics arena break the recent history of this space into BP and, excuse me, BP and AD, before pollen and after pollen, given the groundbreaking nature of this work to bring the topic of psychedelic medicine and therapy into mainstream awareness. How to Change Your Mind is significant and is often compared along with books like Rachel, Carlson, Rachel Carson's Silent Spring for creating a major shift in consciousness. For any who haven't read it, you definitely want to. Michael's a professor of journalism at Berkeley and one of the founders and leaders of the University of California Berkeley Center for the Science of Psychedelics, focused on research, training, and public dialogue, a very important effort that he'll be sharing more about on the call. His particular focus within the, within the center is the incredibly important work of public dialogue to improve the quality of media and journalism covering the ever-evolving world of psychedelic science and access, an important role he is uniquely suited to. I'm honored to consider Michael a friend and someone whose writings on nature, agriculture, and the food system have been a beacon for and deeply impacted my life. We're now buying a farm and engaging in regenerative agriculture, thanks in no small part to Michael's long-term influence, which I'm deeply grateful for. He's also an ally on the advisory council and a member uh, of the Center for the Neuroscience of Psychedelics at Mass General Hospital. And we're very excited to have him join us there for a conversation with the leadership of the MGH Center about the new frontiers in mental health, helping officially launch that center on Tuesday, March 9th at 4 p.m. Uh, Eastern. Michael and I will speak for about 45 minutes before turning over to Q&A. And again, if you have questions, please submit them via the Q&A function on Zoom, not via the chat function. So Michael, welcome and thank you. Thank you, Dick, great to be here. And uh, thanks to the, uh, the people who, who've come to, to listen to us. I really appreciate it. Great, so what led you to write How to Change Your Mind, which changed so much? Well, it was certainly not in my life plans. I had written a series of books, as you alluded to, about uh, agriculture and food and what we should eat for our health. Uh, and and my, big, my big interest as a writer has always been in, in the human relationship to the natural world. Um, but I, I like to look at it in this very um, interactive inter, you know, way. I mean, most nature writers, I thought of myself as a nature writer. Most nature writers go to the wilderness or the desert and uh, observe, but I was a gardener and I like to interact with nature. So I started writing a series of books looking at our relationship to the natural world. One of the important parts and, and most curious parts of that relationship is the fact that we use other species, 
specifically plants, fungi, and, uh, and the occasional reptile or amphibious, amphibian to change consciousness. Um, this struck me as one of the most curious things we do as a species. And I began looking at it in a book I wrote called Botany of Desire, which has a long chapter on cannabis. So, I, you know, I'm interested in how these species affect us, how we affect them, what's in it for us to want to change consciousness. This turns out to be a universal human desire. Uh, even kids try to change consciousness by making themselves dizzy, for example. Um, and, uh, and I've always wanted to understand what that was about. Why is it adaptive to change consciousness? Because it seems like it wouldn't be, that it'd be risky. Um, that I'm it having trouble hearing you. Sorry, <laughs> Siri just decided to talk to me. They're not an official registrant, I don't understand. <laughs> um, so when I first heard, and this was in an article in the New York Times, that uh, in 2010, that uh, doctors at NYU and Johns Hopkins were giving psilocybin, the ingredient in magic mushrooms, to people who had terminal cancer diagnoses, I was immediately curious as to why would you wanna do that? It sounded kind of crazy. Uh, and I followed that for a little while and then um, started researching a piece for The New Yorker, uh, which you can get online. It's called The Trip Treatment. It came out in 2014. This is the first thing I wrote on the subject. And I began interviewing volunteers, patients who had had these powerfully transformative psychedelic journeys. And it really was talking to these people and seeing up close the power of a single experience on a psychedelic to change their mindset, uh, to, to remove their fear of death, to relieve their depression and anxiety. It was, it was the most astonishing thing I've ever encountered as a journalist. And that led me on the path to uh, you know, go further and, and research the field and get to know the scientists and write How to Change Your Mind, which came out in uh, 2018. At the time, uh, this research was just beginning to get some attention. Uh, it was still considered quite fringe. Um, all the funding was private money. Uh, there was no NIH money, and there, in fact, there still isn't, uh, which is, I think, a scandal, given how promising it is. Um, but that was the beginning of my journey. And as part of doing the book, as you know, you know, I, I, I had I felt compelled on the uh, on behalf of my readers to have several psychedelic guided psychedelic experiences to really understand what it was like. Um, and it has been, you know, the most fascinating journey I've been on as a, as a journalist and fills me with uh, hope and optimism about uh, the fact that we may have here a powerful new tool to help address what is one of the biggest crises the world faces, which is of course a mental health crisis. So when I first read the book, I thought I could just like retire from, from the work I was doing, trying to destigmatize psychedelics and helping bring psychedelic assisted therapy into the mainstream. But obviously there was and still is a lot to do. There have been major changes in that less than three years since your book was released. Could you sort of comment on, on the difference in the landscape today versus when your book first came out, doing no small part to your efforts? Yeah, mine and others. I mean, the fact that, you know, look, these results have been really good and they've gotten some publicity. Um, some of them end up on the front pages of newspapers. Um, but I think the book did help legitimize the, a field that was not considered legitimate in the eyes of many. Uh, I remember when I was researching the book, this will give you a, an index of that, uh, interviewing some of the psychologists on my campus at, uh, at Berkeley. And they were fascinated by psychedelics. They were reading the research closely. And I said to them, why aren't you studying this? This is really one of the most exciting things going on in psycho cognitive psychology and neuroscience. And they, they laughed and they said, this would be the kiss of death for our graduate students. Well, now some of those same scientists have joined us at the uh, Berkeley Center for the Science of Psychedelics. They don't consider it the kiss of death for their graduate students. And that um, at the same time, you see all these other very prestigious institutions, uh, including MGH uh, at Harvard, um, now embarking on this work. So I think that to some extent, the stigma has been removed. 
You know, Dick, one of the big surprises I had in publishing this book was I expected to get a lot of pushback from the, the, the psychiatric and psychology establishment that I was giving all this uh, uh, airtime to something that they considered unproven and, and uh, marginal. Um, but the reaction was completely different and surprising. Um, I found that people in mental health, and this includes the chairs of prestigious psychology departments, psychiatry departments, um, big figures in, in psychiatry, were actually um, in, uh, fascinated by the work, hopeful, and said that, you know, we need to do this. We need, to, we need new tools. Yeah. And I think that what has driven it is the fact that there is a recognition in the field that the current tools are woefully inadequate. And I learned this from Tom Insel. He was a really big uh, influence on me. And uh, Tom Insel was the head of the National Institute of Mental Health, very prominent psychiatrist, uh, did some really uh, path-breaking research. Um, and actually, this, this, I first ran into him. Um, this is kind of a funny story that kind of tells you where we are. When I was uh, just about to publish the trip treatment in The New Yorker, it was two or three days from closing. That's the moment the, the, the article leaves and heads to the printer. Uh, I got word from my editor at The New Yorker that uh, his boss uh, basically had some cold feet about running 12,000 words on science that hadn't yet been peer reviewed. And uh, he wanted me, insisted in fact, that I go out and find some big shot who thought this was all bullshit. So I, with a day to go, am like busily, you know, dialing um, big shots in psychiatry and mental health. And I, my first thought is, well, Tom Insel, head of the National Institute of Mental Health, he'll give me a very negative quote, cautious quote. I track him down in Davos and I say, so what do you think of this research? Uh, you know, they're giving psychedelics to people who are dying of cancer. And, uh, and instead of him saying, well, I, you know, this is really, I don't know what's going on here. This is, may not be a good idea. He says, you know, I think this research is really important and we need to do it. Um, and I subsequently, so I had to find someone else to get the quote for the page one of the article. And I did get it from someone at the National Institute of Mental Health who said, these drugs can be abused which is true, they can be abused. Um, but I subsequently uh, sat down with Tom and uh, I asked him why he felt that way. And he said, I don't think you realize or most people realize, and this is after he left the, the job, how broken uh, mental health care is in this country. If you compare the treatment of mental health to any other branch of medicine, whether it's, um, oncology, cardiology, infectious disease, we have achieved very little. Um, we have not significantly diminished human suffering or prolonged the human lifespan the way all these other places have. The main tool we have are SSRI antidepressants and those are not very effective. Um, I don't know if people realize, but um, anti, you know, these, these medicines perform about two or three points percentage points better than placebo, that's all. Uh, their effectiveness fades over time. They're, for all intents and purposes, addictive. They're very hard to get off and people don't like taking them. Uh, they have sexual side effects. They, you know, people put on weight um, and they, you know, and for about 25% of people, they don't work at all. So without important tools, the, the field I think uh, is, is desperate for new ones. And, and the pharmaceutical industry is not working on C, what are called CNS drugs, central nervous system drugs. They've disinvested. So here we are with this situation where one of the most promising new tools for addressing depression, anxiety, OCD, potentially uh, anorexia nervosa, uh, addiction, um, has, is being developed by some very courageous researchers and scientists, no big pharmaceutical companies, no money from the National Institute of Health. Nevertheless, it's happening. Um, and I don't know of another case where you have this kind of grassroots R&D program going on uh, around the world right now. And the evidence gets stronger and stronger. Um, so 
basically, I think to go back to your question uh, way back when, I'm sorry for the long answer, um, that the, uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say there's been an embrace of psychedelic therapy, but there is uh, incredible openness, curiosity. They just wanna see bigger studies. They, they wanna see the phase three results. And we're starting to see the phase three results and they show uh, a dramatic treatment effect. So talking about sort of advancing the field and, and research and the like, it, it, beginning with Imperial College and Hopkins, uh, we're now seeing a number of psychedelic research centers popping up like mushrooms, but nope. <laughs> um, can you share some about how Berkeley's effort came about and how it will inter interrelate and differentiate itself from some of the other work being? It, it's an amazing project and center. Thank you. Well, you know, there have been, there's a lot of interest in um, uh, medical schools and psychiatry departments and, and hospitals to get into this work. And I think it's being, a lot of it's being driven by young residents, uh, you know, young psychiatrists who are, uh, see this as potentially the future and they're driving their leadership, I think, to do things. Uh, the story at Berkeley is a little different. Our center grew out of um, conversations uh, I was having with colleagues in both neuroscience and psychology. It's important to know that Berkeley doesn't have a medical school. Um, UCSF, um, San Francisco, is the medical school for this part of the UC system. Um, what we have is a very strong neuroscience uh, institute and very strong psychology department and a very strong graduate school of journalism. So we began a series of discussions shortly after my book came out and we were watching what was happening in the landscape and we saw a couple needs that weren't being addressed um, and basically formed our center to address those needs. Uh, in order, most of the work going on around the country has focused primarily on clinical, uh, clinical work, um, drug trials to uh, prove the efficacy and safety of psychedelics. Um, and, and we're talking really here about psilocybin and MDMA, uh, which actually is not strictly speaking a psychedelic, uh, but it's often lumped together because it's illegal and um, uh, and, and, and can be used in a similar way, although there's some important distinctions. Um, we, we saw that there wasn't a lot of basic science of, of people who were specializing as neuroscientists using psychedelics as a tool to understand the mind and the brain. Um, and so that was one thing. And that we actually don't understand the mechanism by which psychedelics work. How can a single administration of a drug or a single experience occasioned by that drug have an effect that lasts for months and sometimes years? Uh, is the brain actually changed in the process? Or is this all happening at the level of, of, uh, of the mind? But of course, nothing happens at the level of the mind without the, the brain being implicated. So we have uh, people there who wanna study that. And I can tell you about some of the experiments they have in mind, but basic science to understand the mechanism and use uh, psilocybin specifically to understand things like predictive coding, which is our now the current consensus on how the mind works that essentially, you know, what you see of reality is uh, actually a prediction, uh, your mind's best guess on what is out there. Um, and, and since uh, psychedelics interferes with predictive coding in various ways, it, it sheds light on that. So there's, there's work they want to do around that. Um, the second area that I think wasn't being adequately addressed is training. Um, although there are small training programs around the country, none of them as yet, with one small exception I can talk about, um, offers the psychedelic experience to the guides that are being trained. These are medical professionals, chaplains, um, uh, social workers, psychiatric social workers, um, they take these courses, they learn how to administer the drug or guide people through the experience, which is very important to its success. Uh, just a, a sidebar, this is not simply a drug therapy. This is psychedelic assisted psychotherapy. Uh, and it doesn't work without that container uh, of a guide. So um, we thought since our neuroscience experiments 
called for us to work with normal, healthy, normal volunteers rather than people with mental illness, that we could recruit from populations of people being trained either by our institution or others uh, and give them a psychedelic experience if they wanted it. Uh, the, the thinking being that to be an effective guide, you really need to know the territory. And we have some other ideas in our training program. We wanna do uh, online and in-person education for medical professionals, continuing education. Um, we also wanna offer uh, some uh, guidance to people who are gonna be using psychedelics, even illegally in a harm reduction context how to make good use of them, how to prevent abuse, because uh, they can be abused. And we should talk about the risks. And then the third thing where we saw a need, and this is where my expertise came in, because I am not a scientist, uh, is around the uh, public education. Um, there are still a, a lot of misconceptions about psychedelics in society. I do a lot of public speaking about it, and I'm amazed how often I run into people who have ideas picked up usually from 60s folklore, but sometimes based in fact, uh, about how dangerous these drugs are and, um, and misconceptions about how they work and what a bad trip is and um, you know, things that can go wrong. And things can go wrong, but there's a lot of confusion and misconception. There's also, though, um, there, there are no beat journalists in this field yet. I mean, in other words, there are no uh, journalists who are focused on this, um, making it their expertise. And I think it's going to be an important beat. And we want to train people to, um, to be good at it. Um, I, I liken the situation to the situation I encountered in 2006 when I, or 2002 when I started writing about the food system. Um, there, you know, food journalism at the time consisted of recipe articles in the Wednesday, you know, uh, section of your newspaper. And now uh, there is a very sophisticated journalism around, you know, everything from carbon sequestration in agriculture to agriculture policy, um, nutrition policy. And I think we're at this, we're at an earlier moment now with psychedelics where we need to train a generation of journalists to do justice to it. Um, we also want to convene, uh, use the power of Berkeley as a great public university to do convenings around the policy issues that are being raised. Um, there is a rush to decriminalize psychedelics that, you know, is, is a mixed bag and needs to really be looked at hard. Uh, how are we going to bring these drugs to market? How are we going to deal with a society that wants access to these drugs, whether people are ill or not? So we will convene um, uh, meetings about that, but we'll also have a podcast, uh, a newsletter, a weekly newsletter that'll uh, have authoritative information for people uh, every week on what's going on in the field, both from a science point of view, business point of view, policy point of view. Um, and, uh, and, and we're also going to do a massive online course. Uh, so, you know, psychedelic science 101. So anyone who wants to learn about it can take this course and get up to speed on the science. Um, so I'm very excited about this. We have a, um, uh, a seed grant, um, from, a, a anonymous donor, unfortunately, but a, a very prominent Silicon Valley founder. And, um, uh, I think we've got uh, a lot of uh, wind at our back, and I'm really happy with the team. We're drawing from UCSF. Uh, uh, Brian Anderson, one of the uh, lead psychiatrists there, who has a lot of experience administering the drugs, and Jennifer Mitchell, um, they'll be working with us. And we also uh, hope to work with the Graduate Theological Union, which is a non-denominational religious graduate school, to design a psychedelic chaplaincy program. Uh, so that people who minister to the dying or the sick will have this tool available to them when the drugs are, are legal to be able to, because we have so little to offer people who are dying. You know, we have morphine, which dulls the mind. And uh, I think that if chaplains had access to, or could administer psychedelic therapy or advise people who are thinking about it, uh, that would be a, a, a great gift, a real blessing. So you're doing a really interesting thing there in terms of, of sort of spanning uh, the, medic the traditional medical and psych psychology establishment and ideas like psychedelic chaplaincy and, um, and healthy uh, volunteers uh, so that you can study them. 
what is your sense as to, um, you know, in Oregon, and you, you can also mention, you know, explain a little bit more about that. There are, uh, the intent there is therapeutic use outside of a traditional medical context, outside of FDA approved methods, outside of MDs and, and, and licensed psychologists. How do you see all that playing out? Do you see risks? And what role will, will your center have in, in, in training? Yeah, I do see risks. Um, I think that this rush to decriminalize psychedelics uh, does carry risks for society, for individuals. Um, these are, this is not like cannabis. I think people have to understand that this is a much more powerful agent. And that although the, uh, the risks are surprisingly not what you think they are. In other words, the drugs are virtually non-toxic when you're talking about classic psychedelics. There's no lethal dose of psilocybin or LSD, which is remarkable. Yeah. <laughs> There's a lethal dose of all sorts of over-the-counter medicines you have in your medicine cabinet right now, like Tylenol. Uh, they also are not habit-forming. Um, but for people at certain psychological risks, they can be dangerous. Uh, people at risk for schizophrenia, people with personality disorders. There's simply people who should you know, be disqualified from taking them. And that's one of the functions of a guide uh, or a, you know, a therapist is to check on your medical history, your family's history with mental illness and determine whether you are eligible or not. So simply decriminalizing the, the drugs could lead to problems. And, um, and I worry about a backlash such as we saw in the mid sixties. You know, I don't think people realize, and it's an important story that I tell in the book that um, most of us think of psychedelics as a 60s phenomenon. And the word psychedelic is a 60s, conjures up images of tie-dye and kaleidoscope and Timothy Leary addressing the throngs in People's Park uh, or uh, Golden Gate Park. Um, but in fact, psychedelics are a 50s phenomenon. That's when the most fertile period of research uh, began. And it was, a, it was considered a very important and very promising drug at that point. But in the mid 60s, after the counterculture had embraced psychedelics uh, and they were kind of promoted by people like Timothy Leary as something that would benefit everybody, uh, we had a tremendous backlash. Uh, the media turned on a dime in, in around 1965 from promoting psychedelics Time Life in particular were big promoters of psychedelics because uh, Henry Luce and Claire Booth Luce, who, who owned Time and Life, um, had been very successfully treated with LSD in LA. Um, but in 65, everything changes. And the, and the reason is that there was uh, basically the use of LSD was getting so widespread, it was freaking out people in power, um, including the government. And then it was believed to be fueling the, the Vietnam War protesters. Um, and you did have people using the drugs in a very reckless way that led to some suicides, uh, that led to uh, accidents, uh, that led to people doing some really dumb and dangerous things. Um, you know, the media is, um, is, you know, subject to various herd effects. And after a lot of positive press about psychedelics, the only story you'll be able to interest an editor in is a negative story. And uh, we could get to that point again. So one of the, the reasons that I think it's important to be developing a, a rigorous uh, public education program is to help head off that backlash with good information. Um, so I think that that's important. Now, I'm not, against all the different developments that are happening at the local level to make psychedelics available to people who aren't ill. I actually think that these medicines have an important role to play for people who don't have mental illness. Um, you know, we all struggle with addictions of one kind or another, whether it's to our phone or alcohol or, or certain kinds of behaviors. And these are very good medicines for breaking uh, addictions, for changing habits. We all struggle with depression to one degree or another. We're on a spectrum. And if you think about all the people who seek um, uh, psychotherapy who are not clinically depressed or clinically anxious, but get some benefit from seeing a shrink, um, I th I, that's the model I see. 
is that people, even though they don't have a diagnosis, um, will seek out these treatments to deal with the problems of their lives. Um, and I think that that's a very good thing. Uh, in that case, probably there'll be an MD involved at some level. In the same way, you might have a prescribing doctor for your SSRI, um, but you see another therapist on a weekly basis, that there'll be some clinic you could perhaps go to, that there will be a doctor who will qualify patients and, and write the prescription. And then there'll be another person trained as a psychedelic guide who will take you through the experience. The most interesting experiment going on right now about this is in Oregon, as you alluded to. They passed Proposition 109 in, uh, on Election Day, November 3rd, which is quite an astonishing piece of legislation or a ballot initiative. And it essentially orders the state to develop a regulatory regime under the Department of Health where guides would be trained and licensed and medicine, uh, psilocybin specifically, would be grown under license. And these guides could administer it to people. And they don't have to be mentally ill. Uh, anybody who, who seeks psychedelic therapy and is willing to go through the uh, process uh, will have access to it. And this should happen after two years of developing this regime. Now, a lot could go wrong here. Um, is the FDA going to put up with uh, a state uh, usurping its authority to approve new drugs? That's a question. Is the, uh, are the state regulators who are, you know, obliged to do all these things actually going to do them? Are they going to slow walk them? I mean, how, how responsive will they be to the will of the people here? It did pass by 56%. Yeah. Um, and who's going to pay to develop all this? Um, it, you know, I don't think the bill really provided much in the way of funds. But it's, you know, it's one of those experiments in democracy that are that bear watching. Um, Oregon has led the way before with uh, legalization of cannabis and assisted uh, dying. Uh, and so the state is very progressive and um, we'll see, we'll see what happens. But that's going to be a really important story to track. And, uh, and one of the things we will do certainly with our newsletter, with our podcast, is keep a close eye on it for people who want to watch it because it may be a bellwether or it may be a one-off that doesn't go anywhere. Right, and and I think everyone on this call and many many more will be looking forward to those national conversation on psychedelics podcast for sure. Um, so just a question on Oregon, which a little bit ties into the question of healthy human subjects versus those who have a DSM five diagnosis uh, for a, a mental health issue. Are you concerned at all that? Um, this can be perceived as a threat to mainstream medicine you're done outside of an FDA context and that that might create a different sort of a backlash, but a potentially powerful one from, from organized groups who either to protect their interest if one wants to be cynical or being less cynical who honestly believe that you know, these are complicated medical issues and someone who hasn't been through all that training shouldn't be allowed to alter somebody's mind. I think it's a concern, definitely. I mean, I think that the people in uh, Oregon who, behind this um, uh, have been very careful, are very sensitive to these kind of issues, are trying very hard not simply to decriminalize psilocybin, but create a container for it. And that is so important. Um, we, you know, one of the things we know about the history of psychedelics, looking at other cultures, indigenous cultures that use them, is that they're never used in a casual way. They're always used with intention. They're always, there's always an elder involved. There is a, um, there is a cultural container, a ritual container around them. And the people in Oregon are trying to create a kind of secular, non-medical container, which is a fascinating cultural project. But could it go aground? Absolutely. Um, I mean, we've never had a, a state taking over the regulation of a medicine. Um, and I could absolutely see why the FDA would have a problem with it uh, and the federal government would. You know, cannab I mean, if you look at the history of cannabis legalization, um, it's been very interesting that under the Obama administration, the government basically said, we're gonna let the states experiment. Um, 
we, even though everyone in the cannabis business is violating federal law, uh, whether you're selling it, growing it, uh, purchasing it, um, but uh, we want to see what happens. And the Obama Justice Department told the states that you know, unless there's abuse, unless we run, into, unless you run into problems, we're going to leave it alone. And Trump, that was one of the few things Obama did that Trump left alone because uh, he understood, even though his uh, first attorney general, Jeff Sessions, wanted to crack down on the state's uh, approval of marijuana, Trump understood it was a political loser. Um, and you don't see anybody, um, you know, fighting, you know, trying to increase the, uh, the, the ferociousness of the drug war, especially with regard to um, marijuana. So we may have a situation where the Biden Justice Department issues a similar, similar letter with regard to psychedelics. Um, but all that remains to be seen. And as a journalist, they're fascinating questions. Um, and I don't, I don't have the answers, but you know, that's what we like as journalists. We start out with questions. And we as readers and listeners love learning about it. So thank you. Um, and, and there certainly you know, are a lot that will be coming. Um, a, a question on the research side. You're looking at doing work with uh, low dose psilocybin as well as, as larger dose psilocybin. Is that getting down into the microdose area that people are utilizing a lot and there isn't a lot of research. And also I was just gonna point out to people that there's a tremendous amount more detail as to fascinating studies and work that you'll be doing there. And for those, again, who want more information about it, just, you know, you're happy to share more. But oh, know. absolutely, yeah. I'd be happy to share uh, either in a phone call or uh, we have a proposal, a draft proposal yeah. I can share. Absolutely, happy to uh, tell you more. Um, there's some exciting stuff to talk about. Yeah. Um, we're not looking at microdosing. Uh, microdosing is, is the practice of using a tiny, uh, like homeopathic amount of LSD or psilocybin on a daily or every couple days basis. And it's very intriguing and a lot of people are doing it, but believe it or not, there's like no science about it, no, no significant science about it. It's surprisingly hard to study. It's hard to get an approval from the government for a study where you're gonna give someone a little LSD and then let them drive home and go about their day. I mean, that, I think that terrifies regulators, even though it's, a, it's such a tiny amount of LSD. I mean, who wants to be responsible for what happens? So um, there hasn't been a lot of, uh, you know, placebo controlled research, and there's a fair chance that microdosing is a placebo effect. I have nothing against placebo effects. You can, you can do amazing things with the placebo effect, but that may be what's going on. I don't know. Um, I think there's more hype than, than research around uh, microdosing. It's not of interest to our, our neuroscience science team. They're looking at, um, so a, a normal dose of psilocybin for treatment is like 25 milligrams. That will be a, a very um, challenging, extensive trip. Um, we're going to do some of that, but if you want to put somebody in a, in a fMRI scanner, um, you might want to work with a lower dose, especially if you want them to do tasks. So we're going to be looking at five or 10 milligram doses, uh, which will alter brain function, but allow people to participate in an experiment where you do tasks. Um, one of the, one of the really one of the things I'm most excited about is that um, there is a researcher on campus, a very well-known neuroscientist named Jack Gallant, G-A-L-L-A-N-T, who has what are generally believed to be the most powerful um, fMRI scanning tools uh, around in the world. Mm -hmm. um, he has figured out a way not only to create a scan of the brain where you can see what parts of the brain are activated when someone gets a certain stimulus. His resolution is so powerful, both his software and the machinery he uses, that he can create a scan that you can read in the scan what kind of experience the person is having. In other words, you can go backward and say, he's watching a movie of a very sad scene He's listening to music of this kind. Um, so not only can he decode, he can encode. Um, we've never uh, applied that kind of scanning to someone in a psychedelic state, um, but it's probably gonna work better at a five or 10 milligram dose than a 25, where you really just can't 
take instructions very well. Um, so that's the kind of thing that uh, we'll be working on. Um, but frankly, that's an area for exploration. What is the optimal dose to uh, say change the operations of predictive coding in a way that um, will be illuminating? Um, but that's kind of where we're thinking five to 10 milligrams right now. Great. Well, there's a tremendous more amount more about the center to, to be uh, gone into. But before going to uh, questions from the audience, and there are a tremendous number of great questions I'm seeing here. Uh, two things. One, you, you recently announced your next book, Your Mind on Clients. I pre-ordered. Uh, can you talk a bit about the focus of the book and especially about what you've learned about messaging? Sure, yeah, the, the title of the book is This Is Your Mind on Plants, which is a takeoff on the great, uh, this is your brain on drugs. Yeah. Um, and the book is kind of a deep dive into that question I mentioned at the beginning is like, why do humans uh, like to change consciousness? Why, and why is that adaptive? Why hasn't that been weeded out of our species? And I look at, I'm not just looking at psychedelics or even illegal drugs. This one, one of my favorite drugs, caffeine, um, is which, which is, by the way, the most widely used psychoactive drug, and it is a drug, and it is habit forming. Um, but I hasten to add, it's really not bad for you. Um, uh, what's that all about? How did we learn to do this? Um, why does it benefit us? And so I look at three plant medicines or plant psychoactives. One is opium. Uh, which of course is very relevant today. Um, the other is caffeine. And the third is mescaline. Mescaline is a classic psychedelic. Um, it's a phenylethamine though, not a tryptamine like psilocybin. Um, and it really was the first psychedelic uh, to be studied. It was uh, identified in peyote. It was being used by Nat Native Americans for a very long time and Native Mexicans. Um, and they used it in their uh, religious practices uh, and as a healing agent with, with notable success. Um, and uh, in the 1890s, um, some pharmacologists uh, in, in Germany and Austria isolated the active element, which was mescaline um, and synthesized it. And this is the drug that Aldous Huxley took and wrote about so movingly in The Doors of Perception. And it's kind of the orphan psychedelic. I was very curious as to why nobody uses it anymore. It's not available generally, except in, in the Native American church. Um, so I did a kind of deep dive into, you know, kind of a profile of this molecule uh, and spent a lot of time with Native Americans who use it and trying to figure out what it does for them and their, their culture um, and try to figure out whatever happened to it. Um, the weird thing was I would ask when I started learning about psychedelics and it's important people know just how green I was. I hadn't had experience of psychedelics, um, but I started asking people, um, what about mescaline? How come no one uses mescaline? And, and these are people in the psychedelic community with lots of experience. And they would say, oh, that's my favorite material or that's the king of psychedelics. But why doesn't anyone use it? Well, there's a couple of reasons. Um, one is that it's, uh, you need a lot of material. Um, you, 400 milligrams uh, is, a, is a typical dose. And if you compare that to LSD, which is you know, 100 micrograms or 150 micrograms, um, basically with an illicit drug, the more material you need, the riskier it is uh, as a marketplace. Uh, whereas LSD is so light and so easy to hide. Um, and that LSD basically overshadowed it. The other knock against it is it's a 12 hour trip. Uh, depending on your point of view, it's the most generous psychedelic or, or the one that just, you know, uh, nobody has the time to do. Um, so anyway, I learned a lot about it. it. Does it have therapeutic potential? Based on the testimony of the Native Americans I've spoken to, absolutely. Um, I think it's something that deserves study uh, it can be used more effectively in a group setting than other psychedelics, including ayahuasca, which is already used in a group setting, because people are still much more grounded in the world. They can interact with one another. They can um, uh, have a conversation. Um, they're not visions. They're not hallucinations that take you too far. It has some of the quality of MDMA in it. 
Um, the 12 hour trip is something you've got to deal with. Uh, and that is an impediment. But I, I have heard of a couple of researchers in one pharmaceutical company that um, is proposing to work with it. Um, so we may see more. The opium chapter um, is actually uh, a reprint of a piece I wrote, my first piece about psychoactives in 1997 for Harper's Magazine. Um, and I, uh, I grew my own opium then. Uh, I learned that papaver somniferin that many gardeners in the audience will recognize as something that you can buy and plant and is a wonderful uh, annual, um, was if you knew it was the source of opium was actually a crime to grow. And so your state of knowledge completely changed the status of your garden from a garden to an illegal drug lab. And I got kind of mixed up with the drug war. This was at the height of the drug war under Clinton. Um, and uh, uh, anyway, it's a, it's, a, it's a tale about the drug war and getting mixed up with law enforcement. And, um, but the irony was that the, while, the FDA, while the DEA was, was um, executing this quiet crackdown on gardeners growing opium that I discovered, um, Purdue Pharma was introducing OxyContin same year and the real um opiate crisis was starting and of course it was all about a legal company it had nothing to do with the drug war uh, our biggest problem with drugs begins with uh, a legal pharmaceutical company so it's it's a story about the drug war and that we can see now is now that it's ending with a little bit of perspective and the caffeine story is kind of a romp uh learning all about caffeine and visiting places where it's grown and uh, and there, you know, I normally try a drug to write about the experience from the inside. And I had a mescaline trip that was really interesting. Uh, and another with San Pedro, which is another cactus that produces mescaline. For the caffeine piece, I stopped using a drug, which actually turns out to be much harder to do. I went cold turkey on, uh, on caffeine for three months um, and report on what that was like um, and what getting back on was like, which was actually fantastic. <laughs> okay um great well thanks let we, we have so many great questions from the audience let me uh start start with those great. um so and again anybody who has questions please put them in the uh q a not not in the chat they may not be seen in the chat uh and, and we will try to get to as many as possible but please recognize we're getting way more than uh you know we can potentially uh, get to in this limited time so the que this question, and I'll paraphrase a little bit, having experienced the effect of psychedelics yourself, do you feel, do you not feel it would be a risk for psychologists and psychiatrists to treat patients with psychedelics without having experienced it themselves? And do you see a risk that pharmaceutical or psychiatrists themselves may want to use these in a profit-making way, such as antidepressants or antipsychotics, which take less time and make more money without the deeper knowledge potentially on themselves of how this could uh, affect their clients? Well, that's a complicated question. Um, I think there's a benefit to guides and therapists having had the experience um, that I think that they can be more empathetic uh, and perhaps head off some uh, unhappy experiences. But I don't think it should be a requirement. I don't think we should compel people to have the experience. There are very skilled uh, therapists who, based on um, simply reading and the experience of other people, testimony of other people, could uh, administer psychedelics or guide people. I mean, there's sitters, you know, in the in the informal market for psychedelics. There are sitters who are simply friends that you know have no interest in taking them, and they certainly can be useful uh, in calming someone and reminding them of the nature of reality. Um, but, you know, we have this idea that if a researcher uses a substance they're studying, they've sacrificed their objectivity. And that's an interesting idea, but I think we have to realize it's historically very new, um, that before the modern drug regulatory regime, which really doesn't begin till 1962 after the thalidomide scandal, uh, where this drug was being, uh, a sedative was being given to pregnant women and led to widespread birth defects. And that's when we started the placebo-controlled double-blind studies of drugs. Uh, we didn't do that before. 
Um, it was typical in the 50s that researchers uh, and psychiatrists using these drugs would try them themselves. They thought it was the responsible thing to do uh, rather than treat their patients uh, or their volunteers as guinea pigs. And many important discoveries about the nature of psychedelics were made by researchers. I'm thinking of Humphrey Osmond and Abram Hoffer, who were some important figures in this research in Canada in the 50s, who uh, learned about their potential and power by having taken them themselves. So I don't think it should be compulsory, but I, I think we should realize the value of it, uh, especially with regard to a drug that, you know, you're only gonna have to take once, you're not gonna be doing on a daily basis. In terms of the profit motive, it's, it's happening. There is a gold rush in this space already. I mean, as, as you well realize, Dick, um, there's a lot of capital um, looking for investment. There are not a lot of investments. So the ones that there are are being driven up in value to you know, what may be legitimate values or maybe bubbly values. You know, I, don't think, I think it's too soon to say. Um, there are players getting into the field too that um, are not uh, serious, um, but basically see a way to a quick IPO because the ones that have happened, taken place so far have done so well. Um, but it's important to know that nobody has really figured out the business model uh, here, and it's not easy to do. Um, Dick, you may know more about this than me, and you should feel free to chime in, but is the best play to, to sell the drug? Um, well, there's some problems with that in that you're not going to sell a lot of it. Um, you know, this is not something you take every day, and that really is the model for the American pharmaceutical industry. Um, they like these chronic disease drugs that you will take every day for the rest of your life, whether it's, uh, you know, an SSRI or, a, um, you know, a heart drug or a blood pressure drug, that's where the money is, and that's not what this is. You also have the problem that uh, psilocybin and LSD are difficult to patent. Um, they are, you know, in the public domain. There are kinds of patents about new formulations and, and ways of administering it that may have some promise, but um, this isn't a brand new substance that you can really control tightly for a very long time. And that may be why that we haven't seen Big Pharma get involved yet. Um, so that's an issue, or maybe the model is creating the clinics I alluded to earlier. Uh, and, and, and creating a package, uh, a beautiful place to have the experience, train guides, and the medicine, and that you, you, know, you get it all together in a package, and, and you sell that package as something reimbursable, uh, because it's going to be effective in uh, healing people with depression and other forms of mental illness. So it's, a, it's an enormous challenge to business as usual in both talking therapy, uh, you know, what, what psychotherapists do and what pharmaceutical companies do. Because on the, on, the, on the talking therapy side, you have this interesting phenomenon, which is it's not gonna be every week for years and years and years, but it is gonna be a lot of therapeutic time over the course of several days. Because the preparation is about six hours, the session is about six hours. The integration can be six hours or two hours or even a lot more. So the therapists too have to reorganize their, their business. Um, and I, I just don't think anyone's figured it out yet. It's, it's very exciting, um, but it's gonna be disruptive, I think. And, um, and some people will figure it out, um, but it's not obvious. Yeah, I, I was just gonna add that, that people absolutely, because of the opportunity, people absolutely will be figuring it out and exactly what course ends up being sort of the best or the most profitable or the most sustainable, you know, remains to be determined. But uh, yeah. the, the good thing is, uh, for, from my perspective, and I, is this is bringing a tremendous amount of money into the space. Uh, some of it is gonna be wasted, some of it, you know, whatever, but um, to, to fund really needed research, um, including research that will be related to um, cost effectiveness. So the yeah. third party payers will pay, which is really what's needed to do to make this accessible. I mean, just donors, it's a trivial amount compared to the health system. Yeah, absolutely. With and all of its flaws, with all of its flaws. 
Yep. No, I think that that's right. Um, you know, so the question is, is this going to be a cost effective way to treat depression yep. compared to what we're doing now? Even if it's more effective, um, it's going to have to prove itself as uh, as being cost effective. And there are ways to do that. You know, we need to experiment with the group administration of these drugs, for example. Maybe that's a more cost effective way to do it. Um, Anyway, there's, there's so much, I mean, that's why it's such an exciting field to be covering uh, as a journalist yeah. and um, all these things, there's, there are great business stories. You know, someday the Wall Street Journal will have a, a reporter covering, you know, psychedelic medicine and uh, as it develops and, you know, I want to train that person. Right, and, and you led the way there. Um, so another question, if psychedelics open a window for possible change in, in like neuroplasticity, does that imply that any change would be positive? What might it not alternatively, why might it not alternatively facilitate change that could be viewed as unwelcome or negative? Well, I think that's a terrific question. Um, and that's why the context is so important. I mean, you know, the CIA did its own psychedelic research, right, for a long time in the 50s and 60s. We didn't learn about it till the 70s. Um, they were interested in using these drugs as tools of mind control. Um, yeah. They kind of understood the plasticity piece uh, and they thought they could plant ideas uh, in people's heads. And who knows, maybe they succeeded. I mean, you know, the general story you hear is the that, that the uh, CIA gave up on psychedelic research because it didn't work. Well, that is exactly what they'd want you to believe. Um, and, you know, I don't want to make a conspiracy theory, but I'd be very curious to know what they learned about the ability to change people's minds in negative directions or, or in instrumental directions for their own purposes. But I think in a therapeutic context, plasticity gets molded in the right direction. Um, you know, that there is an intention to break this person's habit of smoking cigarettes. There is an intention to change this person's narrative about their personal worthlessness. Um, you know, I can imagine an evil psychiatrist trying to make, make a patient worse, I guess. But the basic assumption going in is that the the therapist is interested in, in the betterment of the patient. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, there's, there's this whole uh, conversation out there about, isn't it wonderful that psychedelics seems to increase nature connectedness and, and decrease tolerance for authoritarianism. And there have been some small studies that found that a single application of psilocybin, this happened at Imperial College, would increase people's sense of being connected to the natural world. And I know I certainly had that experience and many people do, but my sense is that people are already disposed in that direction. Um, and that if you gave it to the Koch brothers, um, you know, or the Koch brother, um, you know, I don't think that they would suddenly give up on coal and fossil fuel and feel really, uh, you know, warm and cuddly toward the natural world, you know. I think it, 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 it's likely to intensify tendencies that are already present. Um, and this is why I was, you know, when I was speaking a lot about psychedelics after the book came out, there was always someone in the audience who said, shouldn't we give it to Trump? Wouldn't it help make him a more loving, compassionate person? I was like, I think that's a high risk experiment. Um, it could go exactly the opposite way. We shouldn't We shouldn't assume that there's some inherent goodness in these molecules, they're tools. And like all tools, they can be used in, in good or bad ways. Um, so yeah, so plasticity in the hands of the sculptor who is trying to do good things will do good things. Um, but the opposite is at least conceivable. Thank you. Um, what, do you the, what do you think about the John Hopkins study that Matthew Johnson, who presented it on an earlier call with us, uh, presented here that points to the connection between the mystical experience as being the mechanism of action for therapeutic outcomes of psychedelic therapy, which yeah. know, can be a comment about uh, ketamine and ketamine-assisted psychotherapy, um, but also with regard to the value or importance of the mystical experience. Yeah, so the, the, the conclusion at Hopkins was that um, the best predictor of a successful outcome 
it, in a depression trial, but also in these addiction trials that Matt, Matt has done, because I mean, he's done a lot of interesting work on smoking addiction, as you probably know, mm -hmm. um, is that the people who got the best results were the ones who had a, a full-blown mystical experience as measured by you know, this scale, the mystical experience scale. Um, that's a very interesting finding because it suggests that it is the experience, the nature of the experience you're having rather than any um, chemical process in the brain uh, that is the best predictor, that a certain kind of experience changes the mind in, in beneficial ways. Curiously, you don't hear the same thing from researchers in England who don't really like this mystical language. Um, and, but they say that the best predictor are people who've had this experience of ego dissolution. Uh, this feeling that your sense of self has dissolved or exploded and, and then you've merged with something larger, that the walls of the ego come down. And this seems to predict a, a successful effect. I think, they're, you, I think they're talking about the same phenomenon. They're just using a different vocabulary. The American researchers are more comfortable with a spiritual vocabulary than the Brits, and we're just a more religious people. And the fact is that, you know, one, the lead researcher at Hopkins uh, is a, you know, got into this work through his meditation practice and is a spiritual person. And I think that that is a great case of how science gets colored by the personalities and proclivities of the scientists. Um, yeah. But I think we're, but they both point to this fascinating fact that it's a certain kind of um, disruptive, radical experience that allows the brain to reset. And that basically to use this, I mean, I'm comfortable with the either set of terms, but the, the, the loss of the sense of self, which of course is central to the mystical experience, mm -hmm. um, seems to be the key. The ego releases its hold on the brain. Um, you know, our ego is our egos are telling us stories about who we are. You know, I can't get through the day without another cigarette or a drink. Uh, I'm unworthy of love. Uh, my work is shit. You know, it, it's our ego that is enforcing that kind of loop, uh, that rumination, and um, the release from it uh, opens up new possibilities, new connections in the brain. Um, is this happening at the level of the, the, the wiring or is it happening at another level? I don't think we know. Um, but I think it, it points to what's distinctive about this and why this is not simply a pharmacological treatment. Um, Roland Griffith has put it this way. I mean, this is a strictly a hypothesis. In the same way that a traumatic event, such as sexual abuse or uh, wartime horror, can change the brain in enduring ways, certain positive events can do the same thing. Uh, quantum change. So he's talking about kind of a, a positive trauma uh, that he calls the mystical experience, but we also might call ego dissolution. Great, thank you. So we have, I, I, you're referring, you know, here we're talking about mystical experience, but then there's a question, the effect of the guide, how important is that related to the drug and then specifically what approach to psychotherapy um do you think might be most effective if any uh in this work it may depend on what you're treating um so for example the guides who are treating alcoholics and uh smoking um people dependent on cigarettes use cognitive behavioral therapy because in addition to creating a new mindset uh, that allows people to break habits, they still have to deal with the cravings. Um, and cognitive behavioral therapy is a good tool for that. So in that case, they've, they've opted for that school of psychotherapy. And we may find that another one is appropriate for treating people with eating disorders uh, or depression. I'm not sure exactly what they're using in the case of depression. Um, but my guess is that although there's some real basics to guiding, uh, there's the preparation where you set an intention, where you give people a set of flight instructions so they know what to do if they get into trouble. Um, and then the session itself where the, the therapist is very non-interventionist and basically just is there to offer comfort, 
uh, a reassuring word or hand, uh, you know, handhold. And then the integration session where the therapist helps you make sense of it. These three elements, I think, will be um, consistent across many indications that we're treating, but there may be tweaks uh, depending on the particular um, illness at stake. Um, you know, there definitely, there's definitely research to be done to optimize guiding. Um, the way we're guiding uh, is really based on what worked in the 50s, um, pretty much, and in the early 60s. Uh, it hasn't been su subjected to kind of a scientific uh, study, like, you know, where you compare two different styles of guiding. Um, and maybe that work needs to be done. Um, we also have not studied in a rigorous scientific way other aspects of psychedelic medicine, such as wearing eye shades uh, and listening to music. Um, these are curious things. Was there any ever any science to establish it? No, uh, it just seemed to work best. Um, in the 50s, they first gave the drugs to people, you know, sitting up in uh, hospital rooms with fluorescent lighting and medical equipment around and, and then left them alone. Uh, they learned pretty quickly that was not an optimal way to administer a psychedelic. And Al Hubbard, who's a, who's a very mysterious character in my book and, and a non-scientist, non-therapist, he said, no, you've got to create this much warmer environment, bring in flowers, bring in a Buddha, or he would bring in crosses or pictures of Mary and, um, uh, so it, it, it's custom, uh, not, not exactly science. And, uh, and there is one researcher at UCSF, Adam Gazelli, who wants to look at all those questions and, and see if he can optimize uh, the way we administer the experience. Great. Going beyond the psychological effect, uh, question here, how do you feel about the potential of using psychedelics for physiological conditions, such as my, uh, mild t uh, traumatic brain injury, um, as well as uh, any potential for neurodegenerative diseases? I think it's a very promising area of study. Uh, there is some um, very preliminary data that psychedelics, even in small doses, are um, uh, neurogenerative, uh, that they lead to um, regrowth of neurons, and also that they um, uh, are anti-inflammatory in a profound way. Um, and, you know, we, we've come to understand uh, many diseases, chronic diseases, as, as inflammatory diseases. And that may be a use of small dose uh, psychedelics. Um, Andy Weil, uh, Dr. Weil, is, uh, is a great believer that they will help with autoimmune disease of various kinds. He claims to have been cured of uh, both asthma and sunburn by... Um, by psychedelics, um, and this is anecdotal, obviously, but it it suggests an area, interesting area of study. Um, you know, many many people do believe there is a, a, a psychological component to some autoimmune diseases, which are you know the body attacking itself. Uh, I know of one case, a woman I interviewed uh, for the book, who had a debilitating um, autoimmune disease called scleroderma. Uh, that turns your cartilage or your tendons hard until you can't walk and eventually it kills you in most cases or, or a high percentage of cases. And on a uh, ayahuasca trip, she surfaced memories of childhood trauma, specifically uh, repeated rape by her stepfather. Uh, she was adopted. Um, and as she relived that, that horrifying experience, over the course of the next several months, her scleroderma retreated uh, and she regained the ability to walk and she's healthy now. And what, what she hypothesizes is that um, she was uh, like many victims, childhood victims of sexual abuse, uh, was blaming herself uh, and attacking herself for what she had done. Um, and that when she realized she wasn't the guilty party, that it was her father, um, she, her body stopped attacking itself. Um, now this is again, is an N of one. Um, but I think that it's worth looking at these, uh, at these questions and certainly worth looking at Alzheimer's and whether there is any, um, potential there. Um, 
yeah, I mean, I, I, I'd love to see that research being done. And there are people who are proposing to do it. Um, but again, it, it's important to stress um, that uh, they need help, um, that this research is completely privately funded right now. And um, there are there's so many interesting uh, potential avenues of research, um, but it really does depend on philanthropy. So that that's ties into a question that I was about to ask you. Um, you you referenced you know an anonymous donor, which is great. You know I'm thrilled that things have gotten launched and some of the fundraising work that we've been involved with. You know that that is sometimes a situation. Any thoughts on how to um, help expand that so that people who know and understand the value of this work um, can feel comfortable being less anonymous? At which point all sorts of floodgates open. I mean, we, we talk about getting philanthropic support, but right now, none of the big major foundations are providing support, um, almost no government funding. And you know, th those are huge opportunities that, that have yet to be tapped. Now, with incredible yeah. gratitude for all those who have done funding and continue to do it. I, uh, and there, this is like the time when, when there's a huge gap, but any, any thoughts on how to make people more comfortable? You know, I think it will happen. I, I, I think that new research, as, as new research comes out, you know, the MAP study of MDMA, uh, you know, phase three will come out in the next couple of months. That's going to be a huge deal. I mean, this is a, they, they got excellent results treating uh, trauma uh, with MDMA. Um, I think that the research will speak for itself. And I think that people will gradually get more comfortable. I mean, one of you know, our kind of meta goals at, um, at Berkeley is to um, put this research, uh, give it the, 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 the legitimacy that comes from, you know, the greatest public university in the country, um, devoting resources to it, and that it should have the sort of uh, prestige that, you know, Jennifer Doudna's Institute at Berkeley has, you know, where, where they're doing CRISPR work and that we want to put it on that plane. And, um, and that's why we want to do public education as well as research. And I also think drawing better, bigger minds to this field is going to help. And that's one of the things that's happening. Um, in, in the world of neuroscience, I think it's a big deal that Jack Gallant you know, decided he wanted to do psychedelic research. Um, there, we just, uh, Berkeley just uh, hired a very prominent young neuroscientist from Caltech who works with monkeys and, or macaques, macaques. And um, she's, uh, and apparently it was a real coup to get her. And she wants to do psychedelic research. Um, now, I don't know about giving psychedelics to monkeys, um, but, and I don't know that that's her plan. Um, but I think as, as um, very established people in neuroscience, in psychiatry, begin to engage with this work, and as chaplains engage with this work, because they have authority in our culture, um, that I think you will find large foundations, uh, you know, getting involved, and eventually the NIH. Um, you know, as it is, there's not a lot of money for uh, psychological research. Um, but if we start dealing with these uh, physiological problems, um, that might draw money into the field. So uh, I think it will happen. I, you know, I think that what will, what will hasten that is, in addition to good people getting involved, is good information, uh, frankly, um, that the journalism is not full of hype. Um, that people have opportunities to learn about psychedelics. Uh, and, you know, that's why I'm, I'm doing events like this. I mean, I do a lot of public speaking because uh, I think that um, it's, it's a powerful story that, you know, not everybody's heard yet. Yeah, and I will say having, you know, spent some time with you and, and understanding what you're doing there at Berkeley, there are many facets that are fascinating and important, but the, the, the public discourse is, is so so, so well, you know, it's not being done elsewhere. Yeah, what, what you all. find is there's, there's some very evangelical information out there. I mean, there, there are newsletters you can sign up for online. And, but I, I found, and, this, and I found this when I first started working on this, is that you had people on, in the tent who were 
evangelical about the potential of psychedelics. Their lives had been changed. They wanted everybody to know. And I found that very off-putting. Uh, I found like I was, you know, being beaten over the head with someone who was already convinced. Um, and I was skeptical. And I think it's really important to preserve that critical distance and that journalism continue to be skeptical and that this field is going to also have to be uh, accountable. Um, things are going to go wrong. Yeah. There are going to be, uh, you know, un, uh, you know, therapists who are unethical, who do unethical things. There are going to be companies that do unethical things. And so how do we hold them accountable? And, and I think it's with, you know, better quality journalism than, than is now in the space. A question about, uh, about the work being done at Berkeley or planned to be done at Berkeley around training. Um, how will it, I'm paraphrasing here, how will it actually work? You have training programs at CIIS, MAPS is doing training, Compass is doing training. What will certification potentially look like and how will we know if someone, uh, how will we and potentially third party payers know if someone is really qualified, whatever that means, ends up meaning to, to yeah. be doing this work? Well, we're gonna we're gonna work very hard on figuring that out. Like, what exactly do you, what what is what does it mean to be a well trained psychedelic therapist? CIIS started this. They were the first to do it, and they've got a very good program. Um, and we we think though that a Berkeley certificate or diploma of some kind is going to have a lot of value in the marketplace. Um, because you will not only be trained by people like Brian Anderson, um, who uh, you know has a lot of experience administering the medicines, but you will have had the experience yourself. Um, I don't think that'll be a requirement for the certificate, because again, we don't want to coerce anyone into having the experience. But um, uh, but we're going to figure out exactly. I mean, that's going to be a big part of what we have to do is develop a proper curriculum. Um, and, and find the right teachers. Uh, and um, so, you know, to be determined, uh, really. Um, but I think that, you know, we have on our team people from the Department of Education who train principals at schools and do other kinds of trainings. So we have a lot of expertise in training per se. Uh, and then when we bring in um, people, say, from GTU who have the spiritual care component, which I think is important to the training, um, I think we're going to be able to draw on some very, a very unique set of uh, skills and resources to develop our program. But there's still much to be determined. That's why in the short term, what we may do at, when we get our approvals to start our research is go to CIIS, uh, go to Janice Phelps and say, look, we are recruiting 12 people or 24 people for this study. And um, if any of your students uh, would be interested in volunteering, we will give them this experience, which right now, by the way, many of them seek, I'm sure, but have to go underground. And that's a very awkward place to put a training program where you're implicitly or explicitly telling people, if you wanna have this experience, you have to break the law. Um, we're, we're really trying to get out of that box and, um, uh, and we're hoping we'll be able to, you know, for the reasons I said before, in that we are get, we're, we'll be seeking permission to give psilocybin to healthy normals. Right. And it also, in addition to breaking the law, which is obviously, you know, on this call, we're not advocating anybody breaks the law um, or does anything that would be, you know, contrary to, to legal rules. Um, however, the additional problem is then they can't, as you, you've been very courageous in publicly speaking about your experiences, um, it, it also keeps people from, some people from publicly sharing. Oh yeah, no, I, I, none, of the, none of the researchers that I know of uh, have spoken of their own uh, psychedelic experience. And I have reason to believe several of them have had those experiences. And I understand why, I understand why it would hurt their research. Um, I hope we can get to a point where people can come out of the closet um, because I think it could be, I don't know, just kind of more straightforward and, and, uh, and, and, and revealing in various ways. Um, but it's, uh, it, you know, it's just this awkward spot the drug war puts us in. Um, but yeah, I, I have at some risk. I, I was very nervous publishing some of the accounts 
that I do. And, and the book was very carefully lawyered to protect myself to the extent that I could, but I was confessing to, you know, violations of federal drug laws and um, knock on wood, nothing, nothing untoward has happened. Um, a, a question, I, a question on equity and access. Is anyone thinking about who gains access to these compounds? Access to healthcare and insurance is often unavailable to precise communities that need it most. And I'll add the, when that access even becomes available through insurance and, and healthcare systems. For instance, in the field of psychedelics, it's very white. We are facilitators of color, researchers. How do we break the barrier that is not particular to this field, but certainly very present here? It's a great question, and it's one we're grappling with. In fact, we have an executive committee meeting on uh, Friday where we're meeting with um, uh, uh, diversity consultants, looking both at uh, access of this work and participation in this work by people of color, but also um, specifically indigenous people. Uh, I don't know that people realize how much of what we're doing now sits on a foundation of indigenous knowledge. Um, that indigenous peoples, in the, especially in the Americas, have really pioneered psychedelic medicine, uh, have been using it in this context. Native American church is just one example. So how do you recognize that knowledge? How do you draw on it without being uh, exploitative? Um, these are all questions we're planning to take up uh, with uh, the diversity consultants we're working with. Um, it is true that the psychedelic world has been far too white far too affluent. Um, I get asked this question all the time. Uh, why are there so few African-Americans, say, in, in, in using psychedelics? Um, and the, I think the answers are complicated. Uh, I, think, I mean, one answer that occurred to me, you know, the first time I was asked this question, and it was the first time I ever spoke publicly about this, um, to use a psychedelic, you have to feel very safe in your environment physically safe in your environment, because you're basically gonna give up your defenses for a period of hours. How many black Americans feel so physically safe yeah. that they would take that chance, uh, completely letting down their guard? Um, you know, I think that's one reason. I think the history of medical experimentation on blacks, Tuskegee, I mean, that we're finding with um, the resistance to, to using the, the vaccines all these issues need to be addressed. Um, and, you know, it's a high priority on campus at Berkeley. You can't do anything at Berkeley without addressing these questions now. And we will be addressing them. Um, they're starting to emerge some interesting voices um, of people of color in the community. Uh, if you go to the Shakruna website, this is an, uh, an organization that is focuses especially on indigenous knowledge and equity issues like this. Um, you can see, you can encounter some of those voices. Um, and, you know, it's funny, we've had this conversation with our, our potential podcast partners who, who feel that they want me to be the face of the podcast and to be the, or the voice of the podcast. And uh, I keep saying, no, it's, it's, you just don't need another white guy with, a, you know, with a podcast on psychedelics. There have to be co-hosts. They need to be uh, other voices um, and people of color, and um, you know, I, I, we'll win that fight. But um, it's the, the the space definitely needs to be diversified, without question. And it's it's on. I think it's on everybody's mind right now. Great. Well, we're we're approaching the end of our our time together, and just based on questions, we can spend the next four or five hours, but uh, but we won't be able to do that. So. I invite people to, people to please email me and you can either respond to the emails you've been receiving or send it to dick at dicksimon.com if you'd like to know more about Michael's so important work at the Berkeley Center for the Science of Psychedelics. And before concluding our call, I'd like to invite you if you're a member of YPO or spouse and interested in staying informed uh, to join the YPO Psychedelic Medicine for Mental Health Group uh, so that you're continually kept informed. So, and please save the date for our next program with J.R. Ron, who's the, the founder and CEO of MindMed. And that's Tuesday, April 6th at 11 a.m. And again, please join Michael's fireside chat with leaders of MGH's Center for the Neuroscience of Psychedelics. And that's March 9th at four o'clock Eastern time. 
So thank you to everyone for, uh, thanks to all of you from YPO and Synergos for joining today's webinar and a huge special thanks to Michael for your uh, joining us today and all your time, expertise and tireless efforts to get these potentially very powerful medicines destigmatized and alleviating suffering around the world. A thank final, you. You know, thank you. And if you care to make a comment, you're, you're more than welcome to, or we can leave it at- Yeah, no, I just want to thank you all for uh, uh, staying on the call for 90 minutes. I see quite a few of you did. And uh, for your interest and attention to this subject, uh, I look forward to finding other ways to engage with you about this. And, uh, and if you do want more information, write to Dick and he'll forward uh, on uh, you know, your emails with uh, questions or inquiries. Um, but yeah, I mostly want to thank you for, um, for looking, at, looking into this whole area. I think there's enormous potential. Um, and it's, it's one of the good news stories in a, in a time when <laughs> we need more good news stories. It's, it certainly is. It certainly is. And a final reminder to everyone that this uh, recording will be available and circulated in, in around 24 hours or so. Have a great day. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.